everyone and welcome to Be My Guest with me, Mary Honan, on Lear Media TV, supporting the Samaritans, Limerick and Tipperary. And, and my, my guest wonderful guest now. now is Paula Woodgate, all the way from Canada. Hi, Paula, how are you? Well, greetings to you. Good morning. I this found morning here. Good afternoon for you, because it's afternoon and good evening it to is. all of you. It's listeners. almost three o'clock in the, the, the day. It's very hard to keep up with the time zones, especially Australia, so far, they're so far ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. And you're no, always afraid to don't call them because of the time zone. And nobody knows whether you're talking about Irish time or American time, Canadian time or Australian time. And I'm just trying to keep, keep up with it all. But I had two today now, two interviews, Anne Byrne Gibbons and now you. So um, I'm sure the crack was mighty with Anne. <laughs> oh, Lord, we laughed so much. We, we, we were talking about the fact that she invited me to her house uh, for a weekend. And it's only an hour from my house. And I had my West Highland Terrier with me. It took me five and a half hours to get there. Well, just traffic? No, I got. I, I have no sense of direction, and I was using a sat nav that brought me down a boreen, a tiny little lane, and said, "Your uh, your destination's on left." And it was a cow I was looking at. She was um, she was fourteen miles away. I was in. There's two Shrewl. There's a Shrewl Galway and a Shrewl Mayo, and I was in Shrewl Galway. Oh. All right, I see. So, so how are you, Paula? How are you getting through this COVID? Well, you know something? It is just overwhelming. And it's really, it's done many things. It's brought people together. And I think it's uh, slowed us all down. Families have it reunited. We've been leading such hectic lives. We go here, we go there. We're not happy unless we're on the road doing something and going somewhere. But now everybody had to stay home because of the shutdown. And it's been lovely because people are doing things that they did years ago, you know? And I think it's great, that part of it. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm fed up. Um, Toronto now is getting, apparently on Friday, we'll move up to level three. Um, Toronto and Brampton are the last in our area because we're uh, in Ontario and uh, we're the last to move up to level three. So we're, we're looking forward to that because then finally we'll have, um, we're allowed, I think, 50 people in, in, indoors, if mm -hmm. you have any, which means that we can resume classes, dance classes, or you can have 100 people outdoors. Okay, so, well, here now, it's been, it's been for a while now, we could have 50 people. But then there were some events on in Dublin and around the country where you had... Oh, I think there were 75 or 80 st students came out of a, a, out of a, a party in a house. And then, of course, they made it difficult for everybody else because rural Ireland's been decimated because of all of this. Do you oh, know, I mean, yeah. the cities are, you know, will always kind of thrive, especially Dublin. But rural Ireland has been totally decimated. And I don't think we'll climb out of it until for at least two years because so many businesses are going to go bankrupt and have already here. Oh, already. They really oh. have. And the government was very good. They subsidized everybody that was laid off work or had to leave work. And then a lot of people now that have been working from home, it's been such an enormous success. A lot of companies are thinking of doing that on a, a permanent basis. So there yeah, you are. That's, that's interesting because I think people have realized, I, I wonder, you know, landlords and that and people renting out premises will find it difficult to rent out premises because people will realize or business owners will realize that it's probably easier to have their staff stay at home because they don't have to pay rent for premises and uh, or lease premises because their staff can work from home. And you know, my biggest fear that a lot of uh, the parents in the dancing class may lose their jobs, they become redundant. Yeah. And you know what's going to happen, the first thing that's going to go is the dancing class, you know? So and it would be very sad because, huge because they learn so much more than, they learn so much more than dancing at, 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 a, at a dancing class. They learn communication, they learn to mix 
They learn about their culture. They learn to, to be disciplined, to take correction, to, to be determined. There's so much a child learns in a dancing class beyond how to dance. Oh, precisely. I wish somebody would do their thesis at university for that. And the other thing that, uh, that you see too, that if, if, have you noticed, every child in dancing class are enormous students in school. Yes, and I actually spoke about that there one day, that it actually makes you determined and, and, and it, it makes you keep going and, and, when, and, and to strive for perfection. And that perfection carries into your academic, into your schooling, into your academics, into your work, because you develop that work ethic, because your teachers are constantly saying to you, that's fine, but keep going practice more, go over in the corner, look, you're demanding, you, so much has been demanded of you as a child going through the dancing, that you learn to never think that you're good enough, you know. The other thing, I think you accept what you are and thrive to do better. I think that's one benefit. And I think the other benefit is that from the very beginning, the children learn to manage their time. So when they're in school, they, they do their homework. They're very, they get things done in a proper order. They're used to a routine. And then through the, the um, either the performing arts or even just dancing competitions, I think the, the one thing they learn is to be their confidence and learn to accept um, critique and learn to accept um, winning and losing. And I you know, thrive. Exactly, thrive for a better day tomorrow, you know. And be good losers, to be as gracious. Oh, in absolutely. Even if you're dying inside and you feel you've been wronged and you feel as a dancer, I should have won today um, and, and I didn't and you're gutted. No matter how heartbroken you are, you've got to learn to camouflage it and be gracious in defeat as in, as in victory. Do you know? Exactly. I know exactly what you're saying. But I, the other thing that I'm very proud of, you just mentioned, is that when the children are defeated, that they have that um, good sense to go over and congratulate the winners. You very, very rarely see a sore loser. You never do. Very rarely. I've never seen I've, 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 I've never seen it. But I tell you, I think, I think when you look at youngsters nowadays um, who are not in competition, they're not in any form of sport or they're in football, you know, a lot of the time, if they're not in something that's competitive, they don't grow up, be, uh, they grow up ill-prepared for the disappointments in life that we exactly. understood. Exactly. It's right. I concur with you with everything you say, everything. And the other joy of it, it um, our dance art, absolutely embraces the family unit so you learn you know in your spare time the kids are going to class and whatever but then you're traveling around to competitions or you're traveling to shows or you're going into hospitals or facilities to entertain you're always busy but you're sharing those moments with your children and, and as well as that you're getting a healthy respect for age or for or a healthy disrespect if you like for the for, the, for the, the, the notion of aging, because you know there's very few um, careers that you can have, that you can have, as I was saying to Anne, from the cradle to the grave, where you can actually come into Irish dancing and get to know people, the same people from all over the world, right. um, from four years of age, and you can be still involved in your 80s in Irish dancing, and nobody sees age as being a problem and you're working with old people in in nursing homes as you said and in and in schools primary schools and secondary schools all the way up along the line so there is that as you said respect for for the family unit and for the aging process and you know and you can go to a country the farthest away from your homeland no matter where you go there's all, we just mention Irish dancing and somebody knows somebody and you're instant friends. Yeah. We're a net, we're, you know, a secondary family, aren't we? We are. We you know, are. Embraces us, you know. I no mean, matter where I, you go, we have a friend. I said to 
you know, I said it to, it's like, it's like Danny. I said it to Danny. It's like we're one global um, town that we've turned into a village or global city that we've turned into a village because even though Anne Byrne was saying it to me now earlier, if any of her two boys decided that they were going to go to Hong Kong or they were going to leave home and go to Australia, she knows that even if she didn't know the teacher in that area, she could pick up the teacher's book, have a look at it and say, would you keep an eye out on my Danny? Or would you keep an eye out on, on uh, whatever? Do you know, or would you um, just ring him up and say if he wants to come for a cup of coffee, just to get to know him? She was saying that during the, uh, when the, the, the ship was um, off the, in, in Australia, uh, or the Australians, and they were trying to get them off the ship, um, she only had to ring Catherine, or Catherine Coleman rang her and asked her if there was anyone needed a place to stay that they could stay there. Do you know it's... It, That's lovely. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, it is wonderful and it's something we should be proud of. You know, it is definitely an advantage. How did you... Canada seems a, a, a remarkable country to me because it seems... I, so I was born in, in, the U, in the UK and Canada always seems very colonial to me, very English in its, in its um, uh, and it's always been a country that I find fascinating and lovely. And, and, um, um, and I'm just wondering, how did you get involved as a, an Irish Canadian in, in Irish dancing? Well, my parents and brought uh, family over to Canada um, when we were young, right? And at the time in Ireland, it was, there was, you know, no jobs available. So the Irish were leaving in droves. They were going to Australia. They were, you know, going to England mostly, but England was just so busy. And, um, so my father, um, he, during the war, he was in the Royal Air Force and, and he was stationed in Iceland, right? Oh, and, okay. Yes. And then, and then he got transferred, and so he had contacts in Canada. So he, you know, applied, and he got a position in Canada. And then uh, he sent for us, and then we came across on a boat, and then the rest was history. But then the first few years we were here, you know, you, you're, you know, you're reaching out. Um, you know, in those years, um, immigrants, much like today, um, there are those that accept the immigrants and those that don't. And everywhere there be a sign, um, no Irish need apply. Yeah. You know, because, like, definitely, you mentioned England being, you know, colonialized here in Canada. Yes, our government is based on the English system, everything, mm -hmm. is, you know. And, uh, but anyhow, um, so I, my mother wanted me, put me in something, and there was, all that was available was, tap dancing, so I did tap dancing and, ba and ballet, tap dancing, jazz, and baton yes. curling, right? And then, so at, you know, the parish events, once a month, they had uh, um, concerts. And so I would perform there. And then um, one day, uh, uh, one of the Holy Ghost Fathers came in. They had just opened up a high school here in Toronto called Neil McNeil High School. And there was, I think, 12 Holy Ghost Fathers came over. And he was at the concert and he said, came over when the parish priest said, introduced us, here's the Irish family that have just immigrated. And so he said, what in the name are you doing? Of course, I'm wearing a short outfit for the, the baton twirling, right? What in the name are you wearing that outfit? And I just say before you continue, there's a photograph of you. Actually, it's the one behind me in, with you in your costume. And you look so much like um, Dusty Springfield in it. <laughs> and I, just, I said it to a, a, my, a colleague of mine, he's producing the show today, Pat Barry. And I said, Pat, have a look at Paula in this, doesn't she look, look so like Dusty Springfield in it? <laughs> just so. Oh, well, I love you, Pat Barry. I, I, lo I love the old photos. That was taken at the Canadian National Exhibition, which is the largest. Um, fair exhibition across Canada and it's in Toronto once a year. Loved the hair. And event, my mother actually went to them with another lady called um, 
Mrs. O'Grady, had three boys in the dancing, and, and asked them if they would host um, an Irish dancing festival or a fest. And they weren't interested. So, but they kept harping on them because they had the Highland dancing. And um, they kept at them and they said, please, please. So after a couple of years, we did have a fest there every year. But they abhorred having the Irish there. They couldn't understand us sending our entries. Nobody sent their entries in on time, right? And they oh, said, yeah. no, we don't have that with anybody else, with any of the singers or the other dancers or the square dancers or anything. Why do the Irish have to send it in late? Like, you know, and then like once they closed the entries, that was it. You'd never get a late entry. There. And you know, our crowd didn't understand not accepting, you know, we would be only too glad to have, you know, a fesh entry. But they didn't. They, you know, they hadn't made enough money on other events. They didn't require us, you know. But that's where that was. That was about my last fesh. Oh, I, I thought you were the image of Dusty Springfield in it. I just I looked at it and I said you know, I mean, I love your, your I love your point, your, your turnout. Oh gosh, that's that's a long time ago. The little girl behind, beside me in the picture yeah, there. That's your the little costume. Girl, that was my very, very first costume. And the nuns in John Rail sent me the designs, the transfers. Do you remember the iron-on transfers? Oh yeah, my my costumes had the iron-on transfers. So that costume that she's wearing is 50 years old. And I taught her mother and her mother's two sisters. Lovely, lovely family. Actually, her, her Auntie Teresa but, fight for the world several times, you know. But isn't it a very, I mean, that costume now could still be used today um, as a team costume. Did you ever think of, 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 of using it as a team costume and going for something similar you know and you know something that was beautiful about back then is that you threw them in the washing machine went out and they did show or it went to a fesh you threw them in the machine you washed them and they were ready to go the next day they had do you remember the villain inside them did you yes you know to yes. just just to stiffen them and um eugene o'brien's mother used to do the embroidery and alice and uh she used to embroider mine and my costume used to be made by a tailor friend of my mum's, but Eugene's mum, remember Eugene O'Brien? He was I do, yes, yes. He was yes. world champion. Uh, Eugene's mum would make, would do all the embroidery. And, um, and there were, the, the amount of work, I was talking to Gavin the other day about the, the, the work, you know, and he was saying COVID has made him reevaluate how he's going to make the costumes now. And I mean, when you compare it with your girl on the, there, that photograph of your girl, Avery, yeah. uh, you know, the, the costumes, yes, they've changed a lot, but they've, they're still, thankfully, there's still that, that, that traditional element to the costume still, do you know? And you know what, I have fond memories of her. I, we get off the plane every year when we go home. Every parent that had somebody in Irish dancing, every dancing teacher there ever was, we get off the plane and we go straight to Dublin and go shopping. And the first thing we had headed for was Arnott's or I can't remember the other place. Switzer's. Yes, yeah, to pick up the transfers, right? Yeah, and yeah. Them. And that was the first place. And you know, you, some people book their flight a day early to do that because often the pattern they want it would be run out by the time we got there you know? but i was only saying that to mona yesterday um my you know i was an only child my mother was obsessed with fashion and, and my mother went four days in a row to see a movie with uh with an actress in it because she liked the dress that she was wearing and in those days you hadn't got mobile phones or you couldn't take a picture or anything of it. So she'd sit down in the back of the, of the um, cinema and she'd draw as much as she could. And then she'd wait on, and she'd go back the next day and then she'd carry on so that she could get a replica made. She was obsessed. So she used to design my costumes half the time when my dad was asleep. She'd, she'd <laughs> put the paper on his back and she was he'd sleep through anything. But if she was short, one time she was short one scheme of the thread, you know? And she got the train up to Dublin, up to Arnott's, because they had one left, and right. went the whole way up, up on the train just for that one, so that it wasn't a different number. 
because they had numbers at the time. Oh, she, right, because at, I know even with those costumes, the emerald green, there was, it was Coates and Clark number 115. I even remember the number <laughs> of the, the color, right? And there was so many different variations. And you know, when you had like a team, you wanted them all the very same color. Yeah, well, this would have been my solo costume. And I only had cream on the purple and purple on the cream. But she didn't want the cream even to have a different number because psychologically she'd have known she was obsessive compulsive, but she'd have known, so she drove, went the whole way up to Dublin for that one little bit of thread. <clears throat> and, and that's what we were saying, Mona was saying, you know, we did those things. Our parents oh, did those things. Absolutely, but like staying on the costumes, the other thing that evolved from that on the designs, and they got more intricate later on, but they were all taken from the book of Kells. Kells. So the children were getting back to the education, they knew what everything was and then it evolved and then all of a sudden there was round towers on them or there was the Tara brooch. Uh, like you go into class, I'm, I've gone to class and I've had a, a brooch on my jacket and somebody come, oh that's a lovely brooch and they, what is it? I don't know, it's a Tara brooch or the history of the Tara brooch. Tara brooch. Like the designs and the, you know, it took you on a journey, you were educated, you learned about the Book of Kells, you learned about the Irish symbols that's all gone, everything's so showy now, you know, beautiful. Yeah, it's all glitz and glamour now, um, and less about, I suppose, the traditional. Um, um, I like the glitz and glamour, but I also, I mean, when it's of its, the, everything's of its time. And I think I like the wigs because for somebody like me with dead straight hair, who could never put rollers in because they were gone within five minutes and the pain of them. And everyone looks the same when they have their hair up in a wig. They all look polished. And Oh, and I love them. I adore the wigs. Yeah. I adore the wigs. And I've always felt, you know, because so many people who are not in the, you know, the fesh cycle or, or you know, and strangers or from different ethnic groups, they love them when they see them. Yeah. But, uh, you know, our own people, they say, oh, I wish it go back to normal. I hate it because I'm like you. I have really fine hair, very yeah. fine hair. And, um, you know, it, when they dance with the wig on, the curls bounce with your movement. It interprets it. So if you're doing a twirl or you're doing a kick or whatever, it's gorgeous. And I'm just, as I'm speaking to you, I'm getting a flashback of Salt Hill was the first place that made its debut in Ireland at the, at the world's. Um, what's the name of the place in Salt Hill? The, the, uh, um, the oh God, my brain is gone. The, what? So, uh, Pleasure World, Pleasure World. Pleasure World in Salt Hill. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember, because and, and, and you know, it was as a result of the previous worlds held there in, in Salt Hill, was that there wasn't a, enough hall to assemble your teams, you know, or your dancers, even the large groups. So they had to wait outside, and if it was pouring rain, they been in, had been in rollers all night or rags, whatever they were wearing, all night long to achieve these beautiful curls. And then they'd have to line up outside for the competition in the rain, and their hair was straight as anything. But it was the English that came along with the wigs, and I love them. It was a saving grace. So really Absolutely brilliant. I mean, for, you know, when I think back on it, my hair was poker straight. Now, I mean, poker street, and you could put rollers in and halfway through your first dance, my hair was dead straight again. And, you know, we tried in Munster to bring in the um, straight, le letting people have their normal hair with the costumes. And it just looked so unfinished. Do you know, it didn't work um, because you had children with dead straight hair. Or very, very short hair. Very short hair. Very hair. short hair. Very long or and very big. It may put them all on a level field. Like, you know, it's it's because you're dancing on a stage and performance is everything. Yeah. Having that unity of looking the same is the most important thing. It's the same with a uniform in school. I was never in a school without a uniform. And, you know, people, you'll hear people saying, oh, they should... Uh, get rid of uniforms and let children wear what they like but the uniform creates this sense of equality because from the poorest child to the richest child I was an only child certainly not rich my dad was I was 14 before he came he could get a job in Ireland 
So mom only had half his wages, but she knit a lot. She bought, she, she spent her life on me. And uh, there was just the two of us. And I often probably looked as if we had money because she was always buying for me and all that. But there was other children in the school who might, who might have had six or seven or nine children. And they had a uniform as well. And we all looked the same. There was no one coming in in the Adidas trainers or the expensive gear and um, showing other children off. And I think that's, that's the great thing about the, anyone can look equal with the wigs on, you know, and, and then they start dancing. And you hope, you hope to God when they come out and they look so fabulous, you're praying, please be as good as you look. But going back to Galway, I remember that was, it, was, it made its debut in, in, in uh, Galway. And by the end of the week, the media, the, the pictures in the paper were, and the headline was Irish dancers flip wigs in Salt Hill <laughs> because the media didn't like it, right? And that was the headline. The media the has never got to like it for some reason or other. They've always used it as a rod to beat um, Irish dancing back, if you like. Um, there's, always the, there's always somebody going on the media talking about the wigs. And the, Jimmy said that was the saddest thing, Jimmy Smith, for him was after Riverdance. It was so phenomenal, he said. And it gave him so much pride. To, and, and it did me too. I remember where I was when Riverdance was on. I was in my friend's house in Dublin and she was 30 years in Libya and her husband is Libyan. And we sat down and watched Riverdance the night of the Eurovision in her house. And she said it gave her so much pride because what used to get her through the 30 years in Libya was listening to the wolf tones and listening to country music and looking at Irish dancing on the television and she's you know it gave us such a good sense of pride but the following morning you had people ringing up jimmy said the radio complaining about the wigs and complaining about the um short skirts and that it should be Every, people crave for the past always now the past yes. is great but you still have to progress but bring the past with you as you progress and i think we're doing that for the most part Oh, absolutely. And, and, you know, the people that are non-believers and don't like them are the very people that set fashion trends. They have to follow whatever the fashion trend. They have to have the name brand handbag, the name brand shoes, whatever the latest style is. They follow fashion to a T and they don't correlate it. That, that applies to performance too, to stage shows, to everything. You have to have, getting back to what you quoted, unity, you know? have to have unity. I mean, if we strive to make, to, to treat every child equally, which is what we are supposed to do, is treat every child equally, then the greatest leveler for anybody is a uniform or a costume that each child can go out and feel their absolute best and perform at their best. Because the minute you put your costume on, it's like another person. You inhabit, you become another person. You're the, of course, you're the same, um, but it's, it's, all, it's all just a, an image that you've created and you can hide behind that image while you're on stage. And when you take off your wig and you take off your costume, you're just back to little old Mary Honan. But for that length of time that you have your costume on, you make your wig and your, your, your tiara and everything, you're, you're, you can be somebody else. But you, what you said is you can resume your activity. So years ago, that all the teenagers and the older dancers, like they'd have to be in curls, in, only the girls, not the boys, but the, in curlers the night before, and they'd have these tight, but then they wanted to go out to the clubs or partying, and they thought, oh, I can't go home and shower my hair, I don't have the time. Whereas the wigs saved all that. They could, you know, go back to what they normally look at. It, like there's so many advantages. To the wigs. I used to get a night's sleep when I had the wig, well, the, the, the rollers in, in, in your hair. Not a, now a night's sleep, um, tossing and turning and trying to turn over. My hair was down, so it was down. I could sit in my hair, and you can imagine having to sit and wait for it one to be rolled up the whole way up to here and then go around with a net around it. 
I mean, we looked ridiculous and you'd go to mass on a Sunday morning with a head of rollers in your hair. I mean... <laughs> holy rollers. <laughs> no, and you didn't... Think... Holy rollers are. It's a religion in, in, in the States. They were called holy rollers. Really? Oh, no, yeah. The, the, these were called rollers that you put in your hair. And, and you'd go... You were... You, I mean, where was our shame, Paula? That you'd actually walk off to mass on a Sunday in Dublin at the at, at the World Championships or at the All Ireland, with no sense of shame whatsoever, and you'd walk in and you'd go up to communion, and you'd walk down and you wouldn't. And now, when I think back on it, I cringe at the thoughts of 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 your of of the fact that my mother would actually bring me to mass with my rollers in my hair. <laughs> No shame whatsoever. But tell me about who who actually taught you. Um, I in Ireland I was taught because I'm from around Donrail. My, mm. my my mother's from Donrail and Budavent. All her relations are there. My producer and, has just twigged again. He loves to hear he's a Corkman. He's oh, from Mallow. So, oh, I know, and I have cousins in Mallow, right? And, who are they? Uh, my father. Well, my husband has Woodgates, and um, my cousins are um, the Smiths, and the um, pretty well, they're all Smiths, and uh, oh, jeez, I'm having a brain freeze. What's um, O'Brien? Sorry, O'Brien's. O'Brien's. The O'Brien's are in Inchnagree. Inchnagree. In Donrail. Yeah, Inchnagree. It's in Donrail. Pat would know where that is, right? Yeah, uh, Pat knows where Donnerail is. He All does. Right. He doesn't think of any other. There's no other county in Ireland except Cork. As he said one day, uh, you know, Cork people, you know what a, a Cork person with a, a, an inferiority complex is? They think they're equal to everyone else. <laughs> I have no comeback on that one. <laughs> <laughs> they never think of themselves as any any the, the the lowest they can go is to be equal to everyone else. Oh God! But Mallow's a great town, and and uh, when you, when I think of Mallow, I always think of um, uh, Brenda. Brenda's and, brother, yeah. Pat, Brenda's Pat, brother. Pat and his brother went to Brenda. Oh really? Oh, yeah, wow. yeah. Billy He's actually, lovely. Billy Pat's brother was one of the organizers of the Mallow Festival, yeah. at folk festival with with um, okay, right. with Brenda. And okay. it, it, in fact, when I interviewed Brenda and her daughter and her granddaughter, Billy Barry was on with them because Billy has been like a son to Brenda. Um, they've they've always been closer than just a student and. He, he's he's he was with her after they became after he gave up dancing and everything and ran the festival. So they, uh, you should listen to that interview because um, with Brenda and her family because it it was it, it was really nice to have the three generations of Springers on and Billy Barry, and then the the Mulcahys. the Mulcahys, yeah, and uh, who else? As it happens, actually, Brenda, uh, Pat, and the Mulcahys are cousins. So it's uh, Ireland is a very <laughs> small country. Yeah, it's just. Ask Pat, does he know Keith Woodgate? That's my husband's cousin. He's an entertainer. And he has a band in Keith Mallow. Keith Woodgate. He. I heard the name, but I was gone from Mallow for. A... Oh, you're, you're, he's, he's long gone, is he? From... <laughs> he's in Shannon for the last thirty years. Oh. His father and mother still, his father is at 90 and his mother's 91 and they're still in Mallow. Oh. There, there's there's oh. four of them drawing the pension in Mallow. <laughs> 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 the, no, the two parents and three children, oh, yeah. five of them are drawing the pension oh, in the one oh, family. <laughs> they're, they're, we're, we're not likely it's to get rid of them. Yeah, they're a family of of uh, of they're like the, they're like the royal family, Brett, uh, uh, Paula, that you can't you couldn't shoot them. Oh, they last forever. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have cousins in Newmarket and Fergus, the Burks, in Newmarket on Fergus. Okay. And, and but and my father was from Valley Hay. My father was a great hurler, Billy Burke. What was his name? Billy Burke. 
Billy Burke. Pat knows him. Of him. Of him. Of him. And he had a twin brother, Michael. There's yeah. Ten, ten of them all together. Because, you know, anyone, anyone involved in hurling, well, mm -hmm. that's what he's hurling in jazz and he knows him. But, um, but what was I going to say to you, Paula? What do you, how do you think Irish dancing has changed over the years since you started? I mean, apart from the costumes, the actual dancing. I think, is I it think good it for is you or is it, do you crave um, tr more traditional? When you're looking at dancers, do you, do you still want to see the good basics, the good tracks? I think all the basics are always there. I think they're always there. And I think the um, evolution that we've experienced since River Dance is phenomenal. And the footwork and the ankle work. I mean, you look at um, all those challenges right now on the internet, you know, with the brothers and doing, you know, can you do this step and that. And I think um, the commission has done a great job to ensure that all the dancers must do the grades and, and know yeah, the history, you know, and, and the books, you know, and the whole, I think, but I, it gets better every year. I always say every five years is a big change in yeah. style. You know, yeah. you, everybody's doing the same thing. You just get one of the champions to do something, then everybody copies it, you know. That's and it. I remember, like, um, I danced for Mrs. Butler, and I remember years ago, she'd be sending us over in little groups over to get private classes, like, you know, up in Dublin, um, or to Potter Matthews or whatever to bring steps back to Canada because you have to keep updated, you know, and I think once you teach you must Go always to the all-Ireland and the worlds. You have to keep pace You think that um, there should be more em emphasis at majors and that on traditional sets Because you know, I mean we Jimmy and I were talking about it uh, the other day and Jimmy, I suppose, would be very much like, um, I love the way the, the dancing has gone. But, you know, I'm always, I'm not as much dazzled by flesh and, and um, I, I'm looking for good feet and good carriage okay. and, and the ha hands completely in by the sides. And I mean, I have to, I have to be perfectly frank, your girl, her feet are just extraordinary. And, you know, that photograph yeah. is just, and, 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 you know, it frustrates me when I'm teaching, if I can't get a child to go up on their toes, I don't understand it because, but it was, you know, it's, it's obviously natural to her. Um, I mean, it's, it's just obviously natural. Um, She's an but, amazing champion, an amazing champion. And both her parents are from Liverpool originally. Really? So, very, very gifted girl. She's, the ideal girl you love to have in the class because she's a great role model. And great she goes, legs. She works, works, works. And she's combined, she's in her, she's going into her third year university now. And she manages and she'll take buses for hours to get to class, you know, she, yeah. she's just wonderful. But like, um, getting back to the dancing and the, I just love all the new steps. And every year we get better and better and we, new things to try and but the basics are still there you know you've got to have the turn out you have to have the cross feet and you have to have the the good posture yeah but jimmy so. was saying and and he was right you know um he, he was absolutely right mm -hmm. if you can do a traditional set you will and, and you can do the traditional steps then you will be absolutely able to do the um the contemporary the modern steps because you've got the good um the good foundation i'm looking at michael dillon's page now which is excellent page and they're they're starting to do this you know people sending in traditional hornpipes and uh, and you know and and and, and bringing in um to doing a traditional hornpipe step and, and and sending in a video of it and you know and people tend you know there are some who would probably overlook the traditional and say, oh, you know, it, it, it was easier than it was. It's actually, the traditional steps were, were very, very hard. Um, because their simplicity made, was what 
um, was difficult about them because you were you were getting everything to 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 the very basics and getting it right, and and you, we can learn so much from the traditional like the garden of daisies and the blackbird and the uh, job of journey work and that that can be that that were so hard. They are so beautiful. I mean, they really you know in essence they still retain the beauty and the rhythm and everything. I but I really feel, day. I feel at our major events that one round should consist of everybody doing, pick a specific dance, a specific uh, traditional set and everybody. That's what I'm saying, Paula. That's one round exactly. should always yes. have that. I, that's why, it, that's why I, I didn't it, talk about it, but they never ever went any further with it. You know? Did they? Uh, the, it always it always bothered me that yes, it's wonderful. It's uh, I'm a very progressive person. I like to see things move on. I mean, had I you know, I mean, I loved ballet and I love ice skating. And you see the costumes and you see everything moving and progressing, and they're learning. Uh, uh, double lutz and treble lutz and they're 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 moving all the technical stuff um uh, and in ice skating possible levels in ice skating and uh, yeah. but you know and we have to move on but i just think that it would be nice to have one round that is a traditional set yes in ice skating you do have to execute certain movements in it you know it and you be. must in your choreography and i think that is something that we need to look at that you must execute across key across key yeah. and a rock and a rock and a, and, you, and a drum right twist backs twist you know whatever back. we need to have um compulsory movements to retain it so that I we agree a hundred percent there should be a technical and an artistic level to the judging oh absolutely absolutely i concur with that totally uh, where do you see uh, Irish dancing going I mean, from here? I don't know. I was so disappointed when the um, All Ireland and the Worlds was cancelled because I always look forward to it, and I think the dancing is breathtaking. Like the boys now, the oh. material the boys are doing, I I, I couldn't not imagine boys going on their toe and doing the spin or whatever. Yeah. They do. It's so manly. It's so fantastic. You know, it, it's, 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 I think it's, it's wonderful. I think that's why everywhere you go in the world, everybody's trying to get registered into the Irish dance and, and, and get involved because everybody loves it. River dance, yeah. we owe so much. So much. I was going to ask you about river dance. How important do you think that river dance and all the other uh, shows, Lord of the Dance, Beat of Flames, all, all of the dancing I, on dangerous grounds have been. Well, for, I can only speak for us in North America. We were strictly a cultural dance group, right? Everywhere you went, people, you said you were in Irish dancing. Nobody was interested. Or it was in just an Irish thing. So it was a cultural obligation. That's how people looked at it, you know. And they didn't know, oh, what's that? And they confuse us with the Highland dance. And they'd immediately put their arms up in the air as if they were doing sword dance. And I'd say, no, we're Irish dancing. But I think it's it's um, it's pro promoted the dancing in a different way. We're drawing crowds in like three quarters of the audiences are people from other cultures. They just love it. They want to enroll it. First thing they go, most dance studios, regular tap ballet dance studios included as um, part of their program. So it's loved around the world. I mean, it is beautiful, but it's, it renewed Irish dancing because at the time, um, <coughs> excuse me, just before it came out, what was happening in Ireland, everybody was going into ballroom dancing in a big way. They were, they were abandoning, yeah. you know, only for the teachers going into all the schools during the daytime, like the dancing. Nobody was interested in Irish dancing. And once that show came up on the stage, it was so entertaining. It so showed the beauty of yeah. what we have. And yeah. uh, the, rest, the rest is history. But it also, I don't know, did you hear Jimmy's, Jimmy's interview, Jimmy Smith? But um, he said, I always thought I was sexy, Mary. He said, every time I went on a stage, I thought I was sexy. Because I said it made 
Irish dancing um, relevant uh, internationally. It put Irish dancing on a, on a platform that now you see it in Hong Kong, it, it's in Poland, it's in all the Eastern, a lot of the Eastern Bloc countries, it's in Israel, do you know? And, um, and I think that's phenomenal. Do you know that, that, that there isn't a place in the world that you, you can't go to, as Anne Byrne Gibbon said, that she can't pick up the, the book and ring somebody in, um, in, in, in the Arab Emirates and ring up somebody yeah. and say, my son is off to tomorrow. Can you make contact with him? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, it's totally entertaining. I mean, you just look about you on commercials, you see Irish dancing in the commercials on all of the, the uh, comedy shows or the, the, um, the series that are on every day. You'll see the word river dance. Do you, who do you think you are? River dance. It's a common word. It's in the I dictionary. know. I saw it. Uh, I saw it. On, I saw it on an episode of Friends. He said, "Who do you think you are, Michael Flatley?" <laughs> do you yeah. know? Yeah. It really. It it really put us up in on the very very front on, at the world. We're on top of that uh, podium, and everybody knows now what Irish dancing is, and everybody's envious of it. Yeah. And I mean, you're involved with um, Irish dancing at the very top level, you know, in, with, uh, um, in, in Irish dancing and have been for many years. But um, uh, I suppose Niall O'Leary brought up a question about the, the, the open platform. What's your view of that? I think it should be shared. There's nothing wrong with it. If you're a musician and you travel anywhere, you're sitting down with classically trained musicians, traditional musicians, they love music, basic thing is they love music. I think there's, there's pros and cons on having open platform. I think there's nothing wrong with having so many events a year that collectively you can compete against one another. You know, set, set a pace, try it and see. Um, I remember when the split was, uh, Brendan McGlynn was sent out he was his name him. comes up all the time, Paula. Oh, really? Everyone really? mentions Brendan de Glynn all the time. Uh, this is about the fourth interview that Brendan's name has come up, and I loved the man. I loved the minute I'd walk into a hall and see Brendan de Glynn judging. I well, I used to just love because I always did well with him. Do you know? Well, that's the first time I met him. He stopped in Canada. And because he knew someone he was visiting, it probably was Ron Plummer. I yeah. can't remember the time. Another name. He was in Canada for like a day or two, and I met him, and it was a thrill. And then he was going on. His his mission was to go down to California, and um, Cobol was very big there at the time, right? And after the split, and uh, so he went down and he spoke with Maureen Hall. Was uh, the director down there at the time and uh, you know he encouraged all of the teachers there to amalgamate with us so we have one big organization well I mean at that time a big organization probably was maybe 50 teachers or all over the United States and Canada two countries where there's only a handful of teachers in Canada but like in in the big cities like Chicago and, and New York and Los Angeles where you in San Francisco where you have big Irish community um, and there was one t uh, lady I can't remember her name now she was teaching she was from Dublin originally and she was uh, Kogal and she was teaching in Connecticut just outside New York and but eventually then she moved down to Florida and um, there were no other competitions so she joined on Commission. But Brend Brendan, went, his, his journey was to come and, you know, try and get everybody on the one level and to, to join, and, and it did. And there was nobody here in Cobol in North America for, I would say, 35 years, or any other organization for that matter. And then in the last 20 years, there's been, you know, five or six different organizations popping up, you know, but... I mean, I, Sally, Sally, Sally um, Houston, what I didn't realize about Sally was that she was festival in the, in the, yes. and, yes. and then when she came, there was no festival teachers in right. school. So she joined with, on um, Commission. Right. And, uh, 
but it was um, uh, Sally came out on tour with festival and and uh, anytime there was an Irish concert everybody would run to it but like just just the same as when you look at the dancers that are in river dance the initial groups that started you know how they had the the, the Liffey group and the troop yeah. and the, you know all of them there were it was a mixture and you couldn't tell one from the other no um, you couldn't you couldn't and there were some festival dancers in there as well uh, there was one or two festival dancers in in um in river dance um one in particular that i remember i saw her actually on youtube doing a slip jig festival style really slow gorgeous the the, the other thing too i i think that competition keeps you on your toe if you have exclusive rights of any one area or any one um art or sport or whatever you're doing you become like a Yes, you know, you need the competition. You pace one another towards perfection. And isn't that the goal of it? The one thing that does bother me, if I, if I could be honest with you, is totally. the fact every year, year after year, we all go back to Ireland because those are our roots. We want to, you know, re reunite with our families. That We can never understand why the Irish government does not support the uh, Irish arts. All in, specifically <laughs> Irish dancing specifically oh. and their their answer always is well if we give to one we have to give to the other and that's uh, we, rubbish this is our culture is. because we're the ambassadors that you know that are going all over the world keeping that tradition alive keeping people Irish you know yeah. we are the ambassadors and not to see the appreciation you know um, on their level it's so sad so I, I, I agree with you because I come to it, I suppose, from, I mean, I've been in dancing since I was four years of age and danced at every world, world championship. But then I went into Bonratti for 14 years. So I was kind of seven nights a week there. And then on tour, we do 76 shows in nine days. If we went to France, we do one show every hour, five dances per show. Um, so I was only about six stone. I was like tiny, but, you know, and then I blew out. Uh, when you give up but the point is I come to it from a tourism point of view and from the dancing point of view and I see the power Irish dancing and our culture has in bringing tourists to the country um, and bringing and, and introducing say the Israelis the Chinese the Japanese to a culture that they never knew and also by extension to a country that they never heard of so everybody is winning because of the, pro the promotion of our culture and our dance. I, I agree 100% with you, Paula. Our, 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 I think our government is just dropping the ball on, on this. This should be primarily uh, funded. Mm -hmm. Do you know oh, what I mean? Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. And you know, no matter, and you probably do the same thing, no matter where you go to judge, like the first, you get off the plane and you, you, the next thing you do, you're headed for an Irish pub or restaurant. Very first thing, you know. You really, it's, it. um, we went to France one year and the first thing we did was head to the, we were in Paris and we headed to uh, uh, Molly Malone's pub in Paris and there was, at, and now uh, there was a queue so long around the corner for this pub that was it looked anything like an Irish pub. Um, it was all one long um, room, basically, and we queued up for an hour to go in. And we thought, are we mad queuing up for an hour to go into an Irish pub? <laughs> and we were less than five minutes in it when we left because it like it was it was nothing like an Irish pub. <laughs> you know, but just but the, name, the, the name drew, draw, drew you in. We were drawn to it. Do, uh, how big is it now in, in, in Toronto? You're in Toronto. I'm in Toronto. So um, I'm with a friend in Toronto. Toronto's 4,000 miles away from Sally out in Calgary. So yeah. we would be big rivals. Eastern Canada is big rivals with Western Canada. Is it? Oh, very in everything in sports and everything. Yeah. I have a friend in Toronto. My uncle uh, left Ireland. Oh no, 
my gr grandfather's brother was a police officer in England. He was Irish. They were Irish. They were from Carey's Road in Limerick. But then they went to England and then he moved to Canada and became a, a Canadian Mounties. And, really? yeah, that's then, amazing. and then his son became a detective with it. And I've always wanted to see Canada because of that. Because I had all this romantic... Well, you have to come now. <laughs> I've all, I've, I, absolutely. But I've always had this romantic view of Canada being um, Nelson Eddy and, and Janet MacDonald um, uh, <laughs> when I'm calling you and, uh, and <laughs> all of this. <laughs> always had this romantic view of Canada. But... but um, but, um, yeah, our Minister for Tourism, I'm being told, is Eamon Ryan. But we had tourism and we, we had, you know, he's not doing enough for this, for the tourism in this country, you know, to, to, to try and promote the Irish dancing, because that's what should be promoted. Or even get switching to the sports, like the GAA and that. Like, those players need to be getting paid. If they were over here in North America, like... That is a. The, it's an utter disgrace. It. It's an utter disgrace, Paula, that they're not getting paid. Absolutely. I mean, Absolutely. They're, 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 they're putting their lives in danger. One whack of a hurley could actually end their lives, not to mind their careers. And right. all for the love of, you know, this bull about for the love of your county and right. the love of your culture. That's all well and good, but if they, if they lose their jobs, if they lose their careers, they should be paid. Pat right. now is an avid um, a GA and Hurley man who is just a total GA man. Right. In the sense of he doesn't believe that they well, should. My husband was too. My husband was from Kilkenny. Oh. And he was picked for junior Kilkenny. He was okay. really, you know, so, and then with me being from Cork, the, the rivalry was very hard. <laughs> oh, yeah, but Pat Barry doesn't think that they should be paid at all. They should be doing it for the love of their county. That, those days are gone. Oh, for sure. No, they should. Because after all, I mean, it's the biggest draw there is. Look at the stadium. How, how, how much the stadium holds in Dublin? How many? I think they make about two, almost two million. He can correct me now if I'm wrong. But, you know, at an All-Ireland final, and if it goes to a replay, then that's, they're guaranteed another two million for the counties coming back again. Yeah. You know, and Pat will argue that, oh, all the, co the counties in Ireland get money towards uh, funding their, their pitches and that, but it's no good to the players if they get injured for the rest of their lives. No, I know my husband, he ended up having six concussions here that he got here in Canada and he used to say like he says send that those lads out on the pitch they've never ha held a hurl in their life back home but, and so they didn't know how to play and they didn't wear helmets then right so oh. and uh so he had, their helmets and that's why he gave it up six but then later on like he about five years you know it's more than that now ten years ago um he fell ill and uh they started doing all kinds of tests and um, we thought he had a stroke. He had those mini, mini strokes. And they said, oh, you've, you've had a lot of concussions. They knew right away. And they said that brought on dementia. So, yeah. I mean, that is true. And then um, Mike's brother, Billy. That's your husband, was, John. Is that, is that yeah. Yes, yeah. That's, your husband. Kill, that's my Kilkenny cat. <laughs> my friend, my best friend, Carmel, her husband's from Kilkenny as well, Kilmacow. Oh, I oh my in my in laws are from Kilmacow. Billy Grant, he's from Bridget, Kilmacow. Yeah, Billy, yeah, Bridget yeah. Grant. You know Bridget Grant, Ryan Grant's mother. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I know. Her I've seen Billy, that. he's from he's from, he's from uh, Kilmacow. Kilmacow. They're they're Gauls, Gauls from Kilmacow, and uh, they there was seven of them in the family, and their mom and dad died very young when they were, and they all brought each other in uh, up along the line, and they're all in the same accountancy firm. Now, really? they're great lads. They, yeah. you know, Carmel, I met Carmel when I was in Bunratty Castle and um, thankfully I managed to keep my friends, you know, <laughs> just, you know, I'm friends with her now since 1982. So, um, yeah, but I have other friends since I was four, you know, but yeah, but, you know, we're rivals when it comes to the hurling because we're, I'm from Limerick, Pat is from, Pat is from Cork and Nice. And he lives in Clare. He lives in Cannon, so he'll cheer for Clare, right? I uh, know he cheers from Cork for Cork. 
Oh, good. I'm proud of you. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Jesus, no. He's uh, himself and Maureen Farrelly now. Maureen Farrelly. Um, uh, you know Maureen from Cork. That's right. the teacher. Yes, yes, yes. Um, she's, she's, oh, she's a diehard Cork woman as well. Oh, so, that's brilliant. But, um, so you, you, was that your husband playing the accordion? Yes, he played for the dancers. He played all the fascists. And actually that accordion, when he first came to Canada, he was, I think, 15 when they immigrated. And uh, so his uh, sisters brought him that. And it was uh, Paddy Butler's old accordion. So the accordion itself has to be, I don't know, probably over, it's well over 100 years old. God help us. I mean, he, he, so it's safe to say that the, both of you were really involved in the, um, in the, in the dancing and the music. I'm just looking for the other photograph that I have of him. Um, I think it's in, in that one, or maybe. I think they posted the two. Yeah, there, that one. Oh, that one, yeah. That one there. Oh, the St. Patrick's Day Parade. And because uh, we fought for years to have a parade. Like, interestingly enough, um, in uh, Canada, the oldest city, Montreal, has had um, the, the parade, for, I think it's 128 years, but they would never allow it in Toronto. And we campaigned and campaigned for it. So we've been hosting it about 35 years, I'd say. So. Yeah, I think what's good about um, these um, little, as 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 oh, as I was saying to Anne Byrne Gibbons, you know, we were um, talking about uh, the, these show, the, these type of shows and that. I think you know when you look at the Voy message board, I I about four years ago, um, maybe more, I was fresh registrar for the Munster Council, and I used to go on the Voy board to put up people's syllabus. Um, to try and promote their fish, and um, and when I saw this stuff that was up on the board, you know, it, it, not just child abuse and but 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 adult abuse as well about people that, you know, the person writing it clearly just uh, had this view of a them and us situation. It's oh these teachers who do they think they are and blah 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 and 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 you know, or the dancer. And I was always conscious of that. And I thought, you know, people, you know, don't understand the person behind the teacher and what drives the teacher to be as successful as they are, or to be as passionate as they, as they are about dancing and about children. And I wanted, I suppose, to, for people to be able to look, back, look at these videos and see who Paula Woodgate is beyond this successful teacher that you see at a fesh or a member of an commission that you see at a fesh to see the, the, the other person behind it. I stopped going on the VOI board about four years ago to look, to look at it. As Anne Byrne Gibbon says, she only goes on it now to see if they've, if they've uh, slated her after she's judged a fesh. <laughs> yeah, I do. it's not big here in Canada. You know, it's a, a Thank big... Thank God. Moment. It should but be banned. I always, well, definitely, we did it one, at one time about 20 years ago when they first started. But it's the anonymity of it. That's and it. I think, and a lot of times, you know, children in a dance class could have other friends over for a sleepover. You don't know who's on, on your, in, your computer and sending things, you know. But I always maintain when I hear these horror stories that, and these comments that are made, because you can destroy people. And no, I destroy people. And uh, and we we brought in and rolled, and I don't know what ever happened to it. It kind of dispersed. That if um, if you were found guilty of um, an inappropriate uh, comment, you would be banned from competitions for a year. I think it should be longer. But I, you know, I was a parent in my class that that if I thought a parent in my class was responsible for some of the stuff that that said uh, that that. But what I think is wrong, it's the anonymity. And uh, that's it. What's the person uh, in, called in charge? The administrator. Uh, the administrator. They should be held responsible. They should, they should, know they should they are. be able to release the information of who it is and, and so before it goes, because it has destroyed people. And um, I was just talking last night, last evening, to um, M Michael 
feral in New York. We have just yeah. two microferals, and, yeah. and we have a, a lovely microferal here in Toronto, and then the other microferal. Same as Jimmy Smith, in, one in Paris, one in right. Exactly right. And uh, but anyhow, they were about to host this very weekend in New York in the Catskill Mountains, and it's an outdoor fish, and uh, they were going to run a fish and they got the approval from their town council and everything and all was done. And everybody was excited because a lot of people are coming out of the shutdown, right? And uh, they were really looking forward to it and they had made arrangements about the distancing and the masks, the chairs were going to be separated, everything was okay. It was an outdoor fish, right? But somebody put in a complaint and then for them to try and get who it is, you know, it's, it's they're resolved now. I mean, their heart is broken. Like he told me, um, Michael said that he had hired a tent for the event, and they, there are about four buildings on their property, and but they hired an, another to accommodate it because of the social distancing. Seven thousand dollars. So that person, whoever hires out, they lost that income. All the vendors that were coming to the fesh lost that income. All the musicians, and um, we have a number of musicians that solely that's what they do for a living. They play at the pubs during the week and feshes on the weekend, right? They've lost, like, I mean, everybody's hurting right now because of COVID, right? So, but it's sad when you see something destroyed by it's bad. Like, yes. It's like people are policing each other through all of this and, and making judgments about, oh, you know, I mean, we've had it ourselves, you know, if people were even within that much of a distance of each other, you'd have people saying, oh, you know, where's the social distance there? I just wish people would just get on with their lives and not worry about others. I mean, we're such a small organization. It's, it, it, it's nice to be nice. Now, my mom used to have a saying, if you can't be nice, keep your mouth shut. <laughs> you know, and, 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 you know, just don't so say true. anything. So true. Just, just don't, don't say anything. If you can't say something nice, just be quiet. And, um, and, you know, and it's so, it is so true because, you know, life that, is that, that housing is like a cancer, you know, life it's, is so it's, short and we're all, we're, we're, I think it's insidious what's been said on the Voy and, and, and on these social medias and, and, and the, and the, the person shouldn't be anonymous. The, the administrator shouldn't be anonymous. I mean, we, no one seems to know. You are liable for what you say about people. And that's why there should be full disclosure when something is incorrect and is posted. There should be full disclosure of who has posted it and their name and whatever, contacts. Yeah, and because is it, it is written and anything that's written is libelous. Anything that's spoken is, is, is slander. But, it, but, but once it's put down in writing, it's libelous. Right. And at least when somebody says something to your face, you can actually stand up and you can say it, to, you can answer them back, you can justify or you can walk away. But when you don't know who is, it could be your, your next door neighbor, it could be the, the child in your class, it could be the parent in your class, you don't know and that's what makes it worse. Right. But it, it's got, some, some, something's got to be done about it. Um, and I don't know what can be done. But, um, you know, because it, 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 it is, you know, it, it, it's spoiling it for everybody, I think, you know. This particular fesh, apparently, was only one individual that, you know, complained, you know. So, I mean, I, they're trying very hard to find out who it was and, you know. And can they just not ignore that and go ahead, given that it's just one person that has complained? I don't know. It's just only after happening. And it would have been the first fest of the season for hundreds and hundreds of kids. It was children coming down from Montreal. And that would have been close to that area. It would be only like a two and a half or three hour drive, right? And loads coming from Connecticut, New York, New Jersey. So, you know, it's a lovely fest. And, and you know what's very sad is that particular area where they host the fest. Um, it's an Irish park. It's been built by the... the um, the Irish in that area, and more specifically, they have a, a, an Irish thatch cottage built there, and they have the uh, Hall of Fame. Mm. The NAFC has the Hall of Fame there. Yeah, and they have 
they have uh, games there, the Gaelic game, Pat. So Pat, you can go out to the Catskill Mountains, <laughs> take your teams. <laughs> Pat, you can go out to the Catskill Mountains, she said, and take your teams with you. But no, the same thing happened. It, it, the same thing happened a few years ago with, with um, John Kerry when he was trying to organize and Daria um, uh, from Russia, Daria, she's a teacher, when they were trying to organize the FESH in Israel. And it was a huge event, apparently. There was buses going to be bringing you around all the scenes that were on out there. And then there was a group um, outside of dancing that actually ruined it for everybody. You know, they, they, it was a political, a, a, a political group. BDS that actually tried to uh, prevent it and people had flights and everything paid couldn't go out wouldn't go out oh, because they, were, they were afraid to go out didn't, and, that, ha didn't that happen in um, oh, uh, Dubai or somewhere else as well last year or the year before I don't, I know, I don't know about Dubai now but I do know that that they they turned up at, at, at outside uh, classroom outside the school and everything and threat you know it was very very ugly and and it and you know and we don't people don't need that dancing is supposed to be bridging bridging divides bridging bridging uh, differences it, it's a connection it's cultural it's it's artistic uh, music and dance uh, is, a, is a universal language and you know what? What? Whoever did that now to that event is a, it's appalling, and and they should go ahead with it. What you should do is get together as a group of teachers and put in a letter saying that you want the event to go ahead, and and go ahead with the event. Well, I think because of the area it is it's in the middle of the mountains, right? And it's um, I don't know how many hours it would take to drive from New York, perhaps three and a half hours i'm not sure i could be wrong but anyhow i think he, he's already informed the people that it's cancelled so i mean the hotels are going to lose all that business and they were probably looking forward to to rebound from the covid shutdowns right i had to cancel my fish as well in september we all had to cancel it right. Just the, the hall i was running it in they wouldn't allow anything on there this year so there was no other place and Aside from that, I just thought people aren't going to travel, they're afraid. But that was a different event. That was a, an event that you could have had social distancing in, um, in the Catskills. So did they ever resolve um, that problem with Israel? With whoever no, was no they, they had to cancel the, they had to cancel the fish. Oh, no. And, and you know, that would have been an extraordinary, that would have been a simply breathtaking fish because um i've given my eye no i wouldn't maybe not given my eye teeth <laughs> <laughs> but i'd have given anything to have been there you know because it just the, the the things that they had planned the tours that they had planned to see to see all the holy sites and to see the 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 the, the, the churches and the mosques and the all the religious sites the it, um every religious site there is um there to see everything to see the mount of olives to see oh cheapers it was just it was just a rarity to have something like that and, um, and no people had to cancel the whole thing was just cancelled and it was just just awful um, just simply awful, and I just, I just hope that they will decide to, 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 to run it again, because it, it was just amazing for Ireland, uh, just as it would be if it was on in Saudi Arabia, or some place like that. It would be fantastic to have it, or China. Can you just imagine these countries running something? You know, because you know something about, you know, um, Europe and 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 specifically Russia. And specifically, China, they are dedicated in everything they do. Whether everything. They're, if they're a musician, or they're a mathematician, or whatever, they totally put themselves in the wholehearted. You know, there's nothing but perfection. Yeah. Is what you're going to see, you know, like really. And I'm delighted to see it spread worldwide, everywhere. I mean, Mexico has 
Mexico. Three, I mean, three, I five fetches now a year. Like it's oh. phenomenal. I just think that there's every any uh, any place like that that you can promote dancing. The poor little children. I mean, that were that were all going to dancing class, and and there's some lovely dancers coming out of out, out of these countries, these emerging countries, and the disappointment that it must have been. And you know, it's dance. It should be beyond politics. It should be what joins politics, what connects people and nations. Exactly. You know, and, uh, you know, I just, I just, I just, I just despair. But, uh, Paula, you have been extraordinary. And I love your uh, leopard skin. Oh, jeez. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's one of my trademarks. And, and the other trademark I have is I always wear a big flower on I my I always chair. see the flower. So I try and not wear, you know, and I keep saying, but today it was just for comfort. I slipped it on real, it's comfortable. I love it when you're comfortable. And that's how you should be. Le leopard print be behoves you. Oh, thank you very or, much. Uh, 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 I, I have to thank you very much. I thank you very much. Uh, but I have to thank you and, and Lear Limerick TV. I think this is phenomenal. Oh, and thank I, you. I think this is going to go every, I know, and you can you can tell Pat he can do the hurling portion after each each show because no matter where there is dancing, there's hurlers. Great, great, great. <laughs> That's very true. But I just want I suppose Anne Byrne said to me today, it's what what's good about the show, she said, is that in ten years time, in twenty years time, when her children's grand uh, children are looking at it and they're looking back at their grandmother, she said, um, uh, and and being able to see what they were like from their own words, you know, rather than, or look at their own teachers, you know, or your grandchildren will be able to look back and say that was Nana when she was um, teaching Irish dancing and she was talking about dance and it's hearing it from uh, your own, your own words, your own voice, rather than somebody saying, oh, this is Paula, Paula taught me to dance and she was A, B and C. Well, you can hear it from Paula's own lips. But I, like, think I really appreciate it. And I mean, it's, it's so lovely that you've included Canada on your tour and I hope you keep it going. Oh, and I feel Canada is very much, I, I, oh. I tell you, it's just my, a friend of mine who I got to know through, you see my PhD would be historical literature and I got to know Holocaust survivors and children of Holocaust survivors. And one of them was Toba Abramchik and she's from Toronto. We have a marvelous museum here. Yeah, yeah, so, so Toba told me. Right, right. And she's from Toronto and she, she, you know, she's always talking about, she's as proud a Canadian as you are. Do you oh, know and lovely, lovely. Do you know and uh, so Paula, thank you so much for being my guest. Thank you and thank you and, and keep up the good work. And God hopefully bless. we'll see you in the flesh someday soon. Oh, for sure. God bless. God bless. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.